And this is where you start to really think of the cloud as a holistic platform instead of a data center, because it's not. It's so much more than a data center. Talk about a little bit about cloud transformation. So who in here has actually worked in a data center? A few people, not a ton, but a few. Hopefully it didn't look like that. That's <laughs> terrible. Um, <laughs> well, when I graduated, I didn't work in a data center, unfortunately. I, I would have liked to. I think it would have been a great experience. But I graduated as a software engineer. And I started working at a telecom company that you know, owned and operated data centers. So we ran our own workloads from it. We ran customer workloads from it. So I was very accustomed to working in this on-premise world. And, you know, I kind of joined as the kind of web application team. We ran portals, web services, stuff like that. And, you know, we used a lot of the common enterprise technologies at the time. We were running J2EE. We were using JBoss and Tomcat, stuff like that. We had Oracle databases everywhere. Of course, because it was an enterprise, we had an AS400 sitting somewhere, I don't know where. But you know, I remember when I graduated, I didn't really get the concept of interdepartment budgets. And I had written an internal application, I finished it, and I needed to get it hosted somewhere. And I just needed a virtual machine. And I went to my manager and I asked her, what's the next steps? How do I do this? She looked at me and she goes, well, it's going to take us a month to get the infrastructure department to provision us one for us. And we don't have it in the budget. And I was floored. I couldn't believe this, because we own the data center. How are you telling me that I can't get a virtual machine? I'm not asking for more hardware. I just want a virtual machine. But that was the reality. So I had to move on, post it on some existing virtual machine that had another application on it, made it more constrained, you know, to put more load on the system. So fast forward a little bit, and I'm working at Eagle Dream Technologies. So Eagle Dream was actually kind of came out of Paytech a little bit, this telecom that I used to work for. And we had been running data centers for 10 years, and we didn't want to be in that business anymore. We wanted to be in the application development space. So AWS was a logical choice for me. And I joined, and we started writing this healthcare analytics application. And of course, we use AWS. And even though it was wildly different from what it is now to write a HIPAA application in AWS, just because the amount of services back then that were HIPAA certified was very little. So you kind of had to write it as if you were in a data center a little bit. But it felt tremendously different. This is how I kind of envisioned the data center was supposed to feel like. And we kind of went down that path. We wrote a lot of different applications. We continued down the AWS path with uh, population health. And we started to realize that there was something here with the AWS partnership. So nowadays, we're actually a premier tier partner with AWS. And that's really great. But we've expanded the business even further. So instead of just doing application development and things like that, we have a dedicated cloud side. We still do the application development. And then we have things like web development, which is you know websites. This is marketing, search engine optimization, things like that. We have our own in-house governance and security. This is very important, especially when you're doing HIPAA workloads. And then finally, we do communications sticking with our telecom routes. So my job title has kind of changed a little bit over the past few years. Because whereas I used to be mainly an application developer, now I do everything that's anything cloud. I do native cloud application development. I help companies migrate to the cloud, figure out what they're doing and how they're going to transform. I do a lot of what's called a well-architected review, which is where I'll sit down with a customer and look at an existing workload. And this is a three to five hour conversation where we dive individu into individual aspects, like as little as how you're using version control and how you're pushing out changes to how are you architecting your AWS accounts. And in general, I just try to do a lot of education in you know, advocating for cloud technologies. So the title of this presentation is getting the most out of your cloud transformation. So what does that actually mean? Well, the key word here is most, obviously. A lot of people in this room are either in the middle of a cloud transformation or thinking about going through a cloud transformation. But how do we make sure that we're getting the biggest bang for our buck? And you know, we can kind of tackle that issue head on, right? We can take this issue of cost. We can make sure that we're right-sizing instances, that we've not over-provisioned things. We can make sure that we're using right, the right pricing models. You know, instead of on-demand, we can use reserve pricing. We can tackle you know, scaling, because this is really easy in the cloud now. 
But these are all things that I tend to talk a lot about in these well-architected reviews that I do. And they're very important, they're necessary, you know, they're conversations that we absolutely need to have, but because I talk about them all the time, I don't want to talk about them here. <laughs> I want to talk about three things that I don't get to talk about as much, which is application modernization, data lakes, new concept that's came out recently, and then AI and ML, stuff that usually doesn't come up in these, in these conversations that I have with customers. So first up, applica application modernization. So what is it? So obviously, modernizing an application. You know, that is self-explanatory. But really, when I think about application modernization, I think about bringing that software closer to what we consider cloud native. So, and cloud native is this term that we've started using in the past few years that really reflects how you write your application software in relation to your infrastructure. Back in the day of the data center, we used to write our software so that it was agnostic of the underlying infrastructure. And to some extent, that's still true today, right? I mean, if I have got a node server, I don't care if it's running on Windows or CentOS or Red Hat or anything like that. However, with the, what's different about the data center to the cloud is that everything is an API call. So I can start to destroy and provision infrastructure from within my application. I've got this integration point, and that is immensely powerful because now I'm closer to the source, and I can take action a lot quicker, way better than what I would have with some sort of external observability. So I can start tackling things that are, are troubling the system as a whole from within my application. I can start looking at res resilience and availability. So you know, if I detect an issue, I can detect it closer to the source. From within my application, I can start to provision new infrastructure. If I detect a failure, I can kill off infrastructure that's no longer functioning as I intended to. I can look at performance. Again, if I've got a KPI, a key performance indicator that I'm you know, measuring, and I want to keep it at a certain point, I can scale to do that, and I can scale very, very quickly. I can start using other services that would allow me to offload some of that processing power. And then finally, cost. So cost is typically tied very closely with performance. So obviously, if I don't need resources, I can take them offline. And when we talk about application modernization, a lot of the times we're really talking about doing this in the context of migration, right? We've got an application that's written is operating somewhere in a data center, and I want to bring that to the cloud. And in doing so, I want to modernize it in some aspects. So we break this down into three main steps and three main options that we can go about doing this. So the first is lift and shift, which is usually the first place that organizations start. Right? This is kind of you know, specking out servers, making sure that I've got the right CPU and memory, and kind of mimicking that in the cloud, whatever that matches up to. You know, I'm also going to mimic my architecture from what I have in my data center. And this is good, it's okay. The problem with this though is that if I just mimic it and I use the, data, the, the cloud as if it's a data center, I'm not gonna see a lot of gain. I'm not gonna see a lot of cost savings. But on the plus side, at least I am in AWS now or I am in any other cloud provider. And this gives me the speed and agility that those cloud providers offer. So then the next step that we really look at is replatforming. And this is where you might you know, target a few different spots. This is what I call lift and shift plus. And I kind of think of that as if I'm kind of looking at one of those billboards, uh, if I'm sitting outside waiting to get my car washed, where they all kind of build on each other. So this is lift and shift plus. So this is take what I got, migrate it to the cloud, but then start looking at a few different things. Maybe I'm running on Microsoft. Microsoft is expensive in the cloud, mainly because of licensing fees. So maybe I don't want to really re-architect my, my project. I don't want to use a different language but I don't want to have to run on Microsoft. So maybe I start looking at using .NET Core so I can run on Linux. Or I start looking at you know, RDS, which is AWS's database as a service, so that I can offload the management of my database. Finally, I have re-architect, which is kind of the gold standard. This is what we would all love to do. This is where everything is up to be changed. You know, I can use different languages. I can use different frameworks. I can use different database technologies. I can change entire communication paths through my system. Maybe I add some queuing mechanisms in, in there to offload batch processing. And this is where you start to really think of the cloud as a holistic platform instead of a data center, because it's not. It's so much more than a data center. And as you kind of go through left to right on this, you start to see you know, your savings go up, and you, you drive your TCO, your total cost of ownership, down. Because now I'm not managing nearly as much. I get closer to serverless, where I don't even have to worry about you know, spinning up an instance and making sure that it's patched. I just run it. I write the application and I tell the cloud to run it. So then the next step in doing this is we usually talk about databases with application modernization. And this is 
a question that we usually get asked all the time. Everybody ends up asking this question, which database is better? The problem with this question, though, is that there isn't an answer, right? So this is something where, you know, typically if we've got one of the biggest design decisions of the application software, and conversely, it's going to be big, one of the biggest constraints in the system. We've all had the case where, you know, for some reason the application is failing because the database is down. Even if I've architected my system in a way where my web servers scale out, I've still got that single point of failure, which is the database. And if that gets overloaded, I'm SOL. So we really start to you know, look at the database and look at that conversation because that's a key point in our application design. So you know, this used to be thought as the Swiss Army knife of our application development. And that's because of what it was developed for back in the day, back in the day of the data center. You could do everything in a database if you wanted to. You know, I had constructs like PLSQL. I had procedures. I had you know, job constraints. I could create jobs on the fly. I could even make HTTP calls which is a really strange thing for a database to be able to do. But we don't want to think about it like that anymore. We really start to need to tackle that issue head on. And the kind of the adage of when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail applies here. If I've always been using the same database technology and I'm faced with a new problem, I'm going to use that database to solve that problem, even though that might not be the best tool for the job. And think about it. When we're making something tangible, say we're doing woodworking, I don't use a single tool. I use 20, 30 different tools to accomplish my job. And we need to start thinking of application design, databases in particular, in the same way. Because we have different databases that do different things. They're made for specific workloads. We need to start to identify those different workloads. So before we kind of go into that, you know, we need to start asking this question instead. What is our use case? Because based on our use case, we're going to use a different database. We're going to divert slightly because we need to understand something before we talk about databases and application design in general. We need to talk about vert vertical versus horizontal scaling. In the data center, usually we would talk about vertical scaling. You know, my system isn't fast enough. OK, let's just make the system bigger. Maybe I've got to migrate to new hardware, something that has more CPU, more memory. But this only gets us so far because there's a limit to which I can scale like this. And typically, this is very costly. Tremendously costly, and, and especially when you get into huge, huge servers. Instead, we need to think about horizontal scaling, which is really just, I'm going to add more servers, and I'm going to distribute that load. This is really nice because it's fast, and I can use a lot of small servers. And then I can deprovision, and I can provision based on the load of my system. So when we talk about databases, we need to talk about what is the use case, right? So first, we've got document stores. These are meant for OLTP. OLTP is online transaction processing. OLAP, on the other hand, is online analytics processing. So OLTP is what you're usually going to think of when you're serving web service requests and APIs. You need millisecond latency. You want these requests to fly through. So document stores, things like MongoDB, DynamoDB, Cassandra, these are where you're going to want to focus your attention. Relational databases, on the other hand, and by the way, I get this a lot because document stores usually also referred to as NoSQL, right? And a lot of people confuse the term NoSQL with non-relational, but that's not the case. All data is relational. That's what makes it useful. I have never seen an application that was ever developed, whether it was on a document store or a relational database, that didn't have relations. So NoSQL does not mean non-relational. It just means that you store it in a different way. But my relational databases, right? My Postgres, my MySQLs, my MSQLs, my Oracles of the world, this is OLAP. This is going to be reporting. This is going to be analytics, right? And we can do OLTP with these, right? We've been doing this for years, and it worked pretty well. But it doesn't scale, especially when you get into these massive APIs that are hit by millions and millions of consumers. This isn't going to take the hit. It's going to fall down. So we want to use these for their specific use case, which is OLAP. So we want to create our reporting, maybe create dashboards and things like that out of it. But then you'll notice I've kind of got the next line down. This is OLAP2. So where's the difference? And really, it's a matter of scale. So we talked about horizontal scaling. This is where data warehouses come in, right? Something like AWS Redshift is really good at this. AWS Redshift is what we built NextGen Health on. Incredibly powerful, one of my favorite services that AWS has to offer. And it does this. It does horizontal scaling. It distributes all the work to multiple nodes. And I can shrink and create more of those clusters on the fly. So you know, maybe I've got a set amount of data, and I just want to create basic reporting on it. Sure, I can use Postgres for that. But if I'm constantly ingesting my data, 
new data always coming in. That data size is always growing. I don't, need, I don't want to be able to or have to incur more storage costs by just always going and provisioning more storage. This scales automatically. I just go in and use it. So this is where that kind of line gets drawn. Finally, we've kind of got this data lake thing. And we don't know what the use case for that is yet because it's relatively new. This is the past couple of years that this concept has come across. So you know, I'm a huge fan of definitions, so we need to kind of define what a data lake is. So what is a data lake? Well, a centralized repository for all the data in your organization. Or it could be outside your organization as well. You know, this could be unstructured data, it could be structured data, it could be any file format, any type. Right? I could have JSON data, I could have CSV data, I could have flat files, I could have gzipped, uh, something compressed with snappy. But this doesn't really answer that question very well, does it? It didn't for me, because even back when I was in the data warehouse world, I was really used to that, that world, and I was really in tune with what was going on in the AWS ecosystem. When this came about, I still didn't understand. I was used to my own little world of data warehousing, and this didn't fit it. I looked at it, and I thought, well, this sounds like a data warehouse to me. Why would I change it? So this kind of gives a little bit of more holistic picture. I'm not going to go through every service on here, because that would be brutal for you guys. But I'm just going to point out that when we think of a data lake, we think about S3 as the center of our data lake. This is where our world revolves around. And on the left here, we have things that help us get data in there, which is very important. Obviously, to do anything with data, we need to get the data first. So we have things like database migration service, right? Typically, I might have an application. It's got its database. Well, I can use DMS to replicate that data into my data lake in real time. That way, I always have a copy of it. What's the good thing about that? Well, now I can do work on that data without impacting the underlying application. I can use Kinesis, right? If I've got streaming data, say I've got IoT data, I can use Kinesis to get that data in there. So there's a ton of tools that I can do to do this. But I still thought, with the data lake, how do I know what I have? You know, I'm used to my data warehouse, right? I have an IDE that I connect to my database with. I can see the different databases. I can see the schemas, the tables. I can see the columns in the tables. And that's very important for me, because that's that's what I need to do my job. And the data lake doesn't fit that. And that was kind of the linchpin for me. And until I finally learned about AWS Blue, which is another service, basically it's in this catalog and search option, right? So this is what's gonna get me that. So I can throw data in there. I don't care what it is. I can just ingest all this data, and I can use Glue, something called the crawler, which will look at that data and will figure this out for me. It will identify what the type is, what the format is. It will identify if I've got two different files, are they similar enough to be considered the same table? And then I start to get the world that I'm used to. I can look at these tables. I can look at the columns in these tables. I can query those tables. And it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's a CSV file or a JSON file, parquet, anything. I can look at it. So now you know, what I start to gain here is that I've unsiloed all my data. And the problem with a lot of these processes in business is that We've got a lot of these really important applications that do really important things. And they all house data that is very valuable. But I can't look across them. Because even if I have a data warehouse, maybe they're not structured data like this. Maybe I've got data that's sitting in you know, some sort of document store. How do I query across that? There's a lot of insights to be gained there. You know, there's a lot of things that I can do for my business just by looking across what all my, what all my applications across all my business are doing. So by having a data lake, I can unsilo all that data, and I can look at it, I can query it, I can create more dashboards for it. And then I can get a larger picture of what my organization's doing. But we always have to look at, you know, is this useful in the real world? It's fun to talk about these topics and these ideas, but you know, is this something that's actually useful right now? Because I bring it up, chances are, yes it is. So you know, first we look at Centimark. So Centimark is a roofing contractor in, in Pennsylvania. Right? And they had a problem that's actually very common to a lot of businesses. They had data in Salesforce, they had data in their own databases that contained the entirety of the sales pipeline. Well, that's all great, but again, I can't get an overall holistic view of this. So this sounds like a perfect job for a data lake. Again, pick the right tool for the job. So we did just that. We built a data lake, we set up jobs to extract that data out of Salesforce, set up DMS to replicate their database, and now we can query across that. We can look for relationships and set up dashboards that allow us to see it and get a better view. 
We've got TransCat. So TransCat basically gives you know, measurement devices and they also do calibration. They had a very similar problem, but they had about seven or eight databases that all held different data. They had tech data in there. They had calibration data. They had invoicing data, different sales data. All important stuff, but they couldn't query across it. They didn't know what was going on at the high level. Again, right tool for the job. Data Lake's perfect here. So let's do it. Set it up, set up the jobs, create the queries, and we use you know, basically Amazon QuickSight, which is their BI tool for his visualization. Easy job, easy quick wins. So once we have this concept of the data lake, you know, another nice thing about having all this data there is data is prime for AI and ML. So AI and ML has kind of been all the hype recently, right? So you know, we've got all these people that are touting how awesome it is. We've got people that are creating, you know, writing books by feeding AI different you know, incoming data sets. And while they're you know, practically incoherent, sometimes they're really funny. But this doesn't help me as a business, right? So you know, how can I actually use AI and ML to get the most out of my transformation? So this used to be something that required a PhD, right? This is an academia problem. This was something that none of the, the engineers were actually talking about. You know, in our pragmatic and practical world, we didn't care about AI and ML. And while I still think that there are you know, use cases that people put you know, machine learning into that I could solve with basic analytics, right? Give me enough data and I could write a query, maybe it's 200, 300 lines long, but I could get you the same result. So why do I need ML? I think that's true for a lot of use cases, but there are some interesting opportunities here for AI and ML that we haven't really looked at. But again, this was a PhD problem, so what do I care? Well, now we've got different facilities, right? AWS has these different high-level services that allow me to do AI and ML with an API call. This is inherently a software problem now. And I can also dig deeper. I can go lower. I can build my own models if I want to, and I can train it to do the job, but we'll find that a lot of the businesses have the same use cases, so why not create the high-level services for it? So a few of them here, I'm not gonna walk through all of them. Again, that would be boring. But these are some of the interesting ones that I really like. So first we have Poly. Poly is just text-to-speech. Again, pretty simple, but very useful. And this is something that I could use day to day. And again, I don't need to package anything here. I don't need to make sure that my code works properly with it. It's an, AI, it's an API call. I have text, I send it, I get back an audio file. Easy. Forecast. So forecast is something that actually came out of Amazon.com. Right? If there's any company that needs to learn how to forecast, it's Amazon.com. Well, so they built this, and that was really cool, but they kind of turned around and they said, everybody else could use this too, why not? So they let it loose as an AI, or an API call. Again, I can just plug into this. Recognition, recognition is one of my favorites. It's image recognition, right? This is something that we always talk about, right? This is kind of the poster child for AI and ML. So recognition allows me to train a model to identify things. It could be objects, it could be faces, it could be anything that I want. It's an API call. I send it a picture, it sends me back who it is. Textract, so Textract is you know, OCR on steroids, basically. OCR has been around for a long time, that's no big deal. However, Textract takes that a little bit further. It uses AI to really get the context around the, the document that you're feeding it. So now I can do logical groupings. If I've got an invoice, it can pick out specific portions of them and group them together. So I can get all the address fields as one. I don't need to do any of that parsing. Fraud detector, another one that came out of Amazon.com. This is very important for them. So they spent a lot of time to build this, and it's very accurate and very powerful. Again, they turned around and they thought, why not let everybody else use it? And finally, we've got transcribe. So transcribe is you know, speech to text. Again, this is another use case that I think most people have, so why not offer a service for it? There's actually one uh, that I want to talk about that's not on here. It's called Code Guru, and this actually came out you know, around reInvent last year. So Code, Code Guru is really cool because it, it's comprised of two different services. So it's got a profiler, so think about New Relic, think about Code XL, and then it's also got a review tool. So the profiler is awesome because not only is it super simple to set up, but it goes a step further and it actually offers recommendations. So not only will it tell me what my code is doing, it'll tell me what the problem is, and then it will go on to tell me how to fix it. The cycle time gets reduced dramatically. It's awesome, and I've used it, it's super cool. And then it also has the review tool. So the re review tool, you know, think about code reviews in your organization, and how many times you've had to pester different developers to go do your code reviews. 
you know, it's holding up pushing this to production level environment. Well, the reviewer is basically like having a 24 seven engineer on staff just to do code reviews. It'll scan what you've submitted and it'll tell you the recommendations. And not only that, it'll learn how your organization operates. So there's one thing to be said about writing code correctly, but there's another thing to be said about writing it according to what the organization's policies are. And this will learn what those are and recommend based on it. So again, how is this actually useful in the real world? So we've got virtual moving technologies. And they had this really novel idea where they thought, you know, we always need to do these movements, and we don't want to have to always come on site to do it. So they came up with this idea where I could just take pictures of my apartment, my house, whatever, and I could send it to them, and then they could review it and give me a quote. And they were doing this by having you know, actual people review it. They found that it was about 75% accurate from you know, what the actual cost of moving would be. And we looked at this and we thought, this is a prime use case for recognition. And they thought too. So again, we went about building it, and it was actually very easy. So now, you take a bunch of pictures, we feed it to recognition. Recognition basically comes back and says, yep, there's a chair, yep, there's a sofa, there's an end table. It also has to know what's not movable. Obviously, I'm not gonna be moving a window. But it then gives this quote, and they found that, A, well, they reduced how many people they have to have that are reviewing this. They can go on and solve more important business problems. And B, they actually found that it was 85% accurate compared to 75% accurate. And again, quick wins all because we're using the right tool for the job. Uh, Ring Central and Deep Lens integration. So we did this a while back, actually, for another tech talk. Um, we use Ring Central as our message or as our communication platform. So messaging, uh, video calls, things like that. And a couple years ago, we started using Alexa for business. So I've got this little Alexa device sitting in a conference room. I can walk in and I can say, hey, Alexa, start my meeting. Useful, works, great. But then we thought about it for a second. And we're like, well, why do I even need to do that? I want to be able to just walk into that room and it detects that I'm there and that I have a meeting and it automatically starts the meeting. That's really cool. So we went about building that, right? And we wanted to just do a proof of concept to see if this was possible. So we took a deep lens camera, which is basically a, a Linux box with a camera attached to it with some preloaded software. And we trained it to it effectively has to first recognize that there's a person, right? It doesn't know who that person is, but it recognizes there's a person. So then it crops the face, and it sends it to recognition. We've trained recognition to have a model to say, I know everybody in the, the Eagle Dream organization, so we'll pick it out. So all of a sudden, I walk into the room, and it says, okay, Dustin just entered the room. I see that he booked this meeting in this room, and it's on the calendar. I'm automatically going to start the meeting. So that was really neat, but we ran into a bit of a problem because we found out that Ring Central didn't have the API that we needed to start the meeting. You know, it's meant to be ran on a telephony device, and Deep Lens is not a telephony device. So we thought a little bit more about it. We're like, well, there's Polly. Polly does text to speech, and Alexa, you know, understands voice commands. So let's see if we can do it that way. So we did that. So now I've got two machines literally talking English to each other to start a meeting. And now this is not something you would want to do in production, obviously, but it's hilarious. <laughs> and, and it works. And by the way, this took six hours one night. We put this together for a tech talk. And we were a little time constrained. So it took me six hours the night before to put this together. We did it. All because we have the tools for the job now to do what we need.